count was just over 60 on our live stream, and it has been going up every minute for the last five minutes. So we'll just see where we land here this evening. as well as DHS Child Safety and Permanency Director, Jamie Sorensen. So thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. NASW Minnesota is the largest professional association of social workers in the state, with nearly 2,000 members and representing the interests of all Minnesota social workers, nearly 15,000 licensed practitioners. Nationwide, NASW has over 120,000 members and is considered the voice of our profession. Social workers are essential. I don't have to tell all of you that. We know social workers are essential in all of our lives. We're the front line in serving and helping our most disadvantaged members of society in areas such as child protection, aging and disability services, homelessness, domestic violence, mental health needs, schools, health care, and so much more. Yet broad scale workload increases and inadequate funding continue to impact our service to clients and social workers' working conditions in general and the public at large. There is a growing perception among social workers that these issues are worsening, and the impact on social workers and our communities is deeply concerning to us as social workers. When we at NASW Minnesota surveyed our members to put together our legislative agenda, year after year, by far the response that we get from all of our social workers who are our members is to prioritize the issues that are affecting our clients. Healthcare, affordable housing, mental health, elimination of racial disparities. It's no surprise to all of you, you're all nodding at me. You're saying, yeah, of course, those are things we care about, right? And the issues about supporting social workers themselves always seem to fall to the bottom of that list. We ask you guys the question, where do you want us to prioritize these things? And you put yourselves at the bottom of that list. But then throughout the year, I continue to hear again and again from our social work community, well, what's NASW doing about pay? And what's NASW doing about caseload sizes and funding cuts and our student loan debt and so many of the other issues that are affecting our practice? So while we will continue to work on the issues that affect our clients, this town hall was developed because we've heard clearly from social workers throughout the state that you need us to tackle the issues on the policy level and with our funders and in your workplaces and in the general public that are affecting your ability to do your work. To start framing this work, we surveyed our membership about the workforce issues most concerning to them. And so we're good data-driven social workers, right? So we always ask you and then we pay attention. So for about 82% of our respondents, pay and reimbursement and funding were on the top of your list. For about 70%, caseload size was the top of that list. And those were followed by student loan debt as a concern for just over half of our social work respondents, and then staffing levels and issues of equity for indigenous and people of color and LGBTQIA individuals. So I'm going to share a little more details about some of the data that informs our thinking about this. Tonight's really about the stories. It's not about the data, but just to help us all be on the same page and for our legislators to know sort of where we're at. I want to talk a little bit about pay inequities first. So historically, pay inequities for the social work field, research has shown, come from two things. One, the fact that we're a female-dominated field, and the second is our willingness to accept low pay. I didn't make it up, you guys. This is what the data, the research is showing us. But we know this. You all giggle because it's true. So while we've successfully diminished our gender gap, we're down to about a 3 to 6% difference between males and females within our profession. That's pretty good. We're pretty solid and in line with other professions. Our next call to action really has to be about the pay gap for professional services and being paid for the work that we do in comparison to all of the others that work in our spaces, right? So in 2007, which is some of the best data that we have currently, social workers' monthly wage was about 20% lower than all other professions and 31% lower than registered nurses. So just as a, a little comparison for us. So I want to say to you all, we have to stop accepting low pay, right? We have to stop accepting low pay. I've said this in front of 1,000 plus students at Social Work Day at the Capitol and in every place I can, you guys. I don't ever want to hear a social worker saying, well, we're not in it for the money. 
right? Or we're in it for the outcomes, not the income, right? Because the reality is you're right. We are not driven by dollars. But at the end of the day, we all need to be paid what we're worth for the work that we do. And if we don't accept, if we accept low wage or we don't ex expect what we are worth, then in our workplaces, they will continue to pay certain professionals at certain rates because they require it. And then at the bottom of the list, they'll say, and the social workers, we'll just, we'll pay them, you know, sort of what's left kind of thing. That's not okay with us. And I don't want it to be okay for any of you to use that language any longer. Another issue that's very concerning is educational debt. So we know that all professionals leave school with education debt. We know that the greatest percentage of social workers out in the world are master's level social workers, which means they leave with a lot of educational debt, just like all master's level um, educated folks. The average debt for a bachelor's level social worker is about $28,000, and a master's level is about $44,000. We also know that because of what we just talked about with earning potential, that because our earning potential is slightly below other professions, it takes us a lot longer to pay off our debt. And we make choices about the kinds of places that we work because of that also, which is not helping our clients and the potential for hiring for our employers, and especially in rural areas where they can't compete with other professions, and then they have a difficult time getting good, trained people to take those jobs. Another area is caseload size. So child, youth, and family workers by research have been shown to have double the recommended 16 to 17 ca um, cases on their caseload. And large caseload has been found to be the largest contributor to practitioner burnout and have linked, has been linked to less effective results for clients served. No surprise to any of us. But larger caseloads are also found to correlate with practitioners developing secondary trauma sy symptoms. And we just can't be okay with burnout and secondary trauma in our field. There's also some places in policy where there are some glitches. There are some glitches where social workers who are trained to do certain kinds of work can't do their jobs or get paid for the certain work that they do because of some of these little legislator, legislative glitches. Sorry, legislators, I'm looking right at you now. Yes, so a couple of those we're gonna work really hard on this year because these are the small changes that just need to be made. So by law in Minnesota, clinical social workers can diagnose. They do diagnose, they diagnose all kinds of things. One example that we have a little problem with is ADHD. So if a young child goes out into the world and meets with a clinical social worker and gets a diagnosis of ADHD, and then their family tries to bring that to their school for a special ed support services, in our special ed law currently, they are not eligible for special ed services with a diagnosis from a clinical social worker. It's just a word, uh, two words, social worker, that needs to be added back into that legislation. Another is diagnosis of PTSD in our workers' compensation law. Same problem, need to change that. These are access issues for families, especially for families in rural areas, and we shouldn't make any family have two clinicians in their family's life. It's complicating, it's far too much in terms of all kinds of things. So we need to fix those small things that will make a big difference for families to get the services that they need. And there's so many other examples of social work, well, workforce issues affecting our social work workforce in Minnesota. So tonight we're gonna do three things. We're gonna hear some important framing for this conversation from Dr. Jessica Toft, assistant professor at the social work, School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota. She'll also be our moderator for the evening. And then we'll have about a half hour for 15 or more of our social workers in the audience to share their stories. And they'll have about two minutes or less each so that our decision makers and our social work community can have an up-to-date understanding of social work conditions today and their impact on clients and society. We know as social workers, when we go to school, we hear from one another, we're in community with one another, and then we often get siloed up. So we're aware of the issues in our small workplace or in the area of practice that we're in, and then we get farther and further away from it. We might not be aware that, man, it's not just my area of practice that's being affected by this issue. So we need to hear from all different areas of practice and see where those overlaps are and see what the different issues are that you're struggling with. And then we will have about a half hour where we'll hear from our policymakers. So they'll each get about five minutes to share what they've learned, um, what they've heard from us, what stands out, and give us a sense of how they'll engage with us to address these issues. And at the outset, I just wanna let you know that 
as I said earlier, NASW Minnesota sees this work as a movement. This is not a one and done event. Our tonight's conversation is just the beginning. We know that having a conversation amongst ourselves and having a conversation with a handful of legislators is a start, but there's a whole heck of a lot more that's going to need to be done to actually affect the things that we're talking about tonight. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jessica Toft, our moderator for the evening, who will share some important framing for the conversation based on her research. Dr. Toft? Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see so many smiling faces in the audience. Um, and you don't have to smile just because you're a social worker. In fact, if, if you want to do the opposite, that's fine. Um, so uh, I think I've got some PowerPoint slides here. Um, so first of all, I'm really glad to see decision makers here um, in uh, the audience. Um, and I would like to, first of all, do what social workers do best, and that is have a massive check-in, shall we? Let's have a massive check-in. All right. So I want you to play a game with me. You're going to raise your hands when I say uh, your type of social work. So here we go. How many of you here are clinical mental health social workers? Please raise your hand. Keep them up. This is going to be trial for you. How many are hospital social workers? Keep your, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Okay. Nursing home care social workers. Keep, keep them up, everybody, the whole time. Child welfare workers of any kind. Hospice social, social workers. Case managers. Community-based and neighborhood agency social workers. How about students and faculty? You're not sure exactly who you are. Okay, great, put your hands down. And if you're playing at home, I hope you raised your hand too, just in spirit of solidarity. Second game in our check-in is, I'd like to know what kind of position you hold in your particular uh, place of work. How many of you work directly with service users of some kind, directly? How many of you are supervisors, where you supervise, keep your hands up for a while, you supervisors, where you um, actually supervise someone. If you're a student and you think you're going to be a supervisor someday, why don't you raise your hand? There's some good optimistic people. How about upper uh, program managers? How about executive directors? Do we have any executive directors here? All right. Okay. Very good. And how many, if we have a county um, representative here, uh, how about a, a county commissioner representative here who's a social worker? Rafael Ortega's representative is here, and he's a licensed social worker. Look around the room. We are... You can go ahead and go to the next slide. We are the backbone, yes, of social provision in the state of Minnesota. Social workers since 1912 have been positioned by the state to help the marginalized, the vulnerable, and the poor. And that's one of the reasons that we get in this profession. And we, uh, as Karen said, would like to be recognized for that work too. Um, but it also, it, for us, we have a commitment to our code of ethics. And you can put that up right now. And our code of ethics, and apparently we are the only profession, according to Frank Reamer, that has social justice as an aim in our profession. We actually sign up to this realizing that we are supposed to be advocating for social justice. And social justice really has two parts. You can go to the next slide. It's hard for me to see right here. Um, first part is that we, justice. This is something that really comes very naturally to us, this idea of rights. Uh, as an American, you know, I've got um, a due process. I have, um, I can't even see my slide, due process, uh, fairness, um, that uh, I'm recognized, I have autonomy in my actions. But the part that's trickier for us and for a democracy is the social part. As a country, we have to learn how to have justice within a social collective somehow. And this is the part that social worker brings to the table. We have to have collective responsibility, as a, a, not only as social workers, but as a democracy. And so I would like to argue that social workers actually promote democracy more than any other profession because we actually have social justice built into our code of ethics. So I see ourselves as a sort of an agent of democratic uh, engagement. This is a big commitment for social workers, um, and it also puts two heavy uh, pieces on our plate. Um, the first is, uh, because we work with the poor and the marginalized and vulnerable people, and we're trying to promote justice, and we work directly with them, we are best positioned out of any professional to help people embody their rights in a democracy as persons with equal moral worth. Secondly, we are also best positioned to keep people from these rights. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
we have a heavy burden that because of we are the direct interface. So let's take it, next slide please. We can think about the ways in which we social workers have our work uh, uh, in, in terms of a linear model if you want to, maybe a top-down centralist model as though it moves from uh, you know, uh, legislative law to administrative rules to organizations um, creating uh, you know, contracts with agencies and then down to the supervisor who's going to supervise the direct line worker. And that's the way that we've often thought about it. In fact, I think I've taught it that way in class. I'm a little sorry about that. But if we really think about it and research shows, there's discretion at every chain along the way. And that actually from le legislative to rulemaking, there are decisions that are made. There's discretion about what kinds of rules are made. And from the state agency rulemaking to the contracts that state agencies get, there are decisions, there's discretion that's made. And for us as social workers, it's important to know in our history, managed care is now helping to deliver what should be public goods that we as citizens have voted for. So we've got a private entity who's in there who's helping to disperse public goods for democratic aims. And if you see that there's a little tension here, you're listening, you're picking up what I'm putting down. So this is one of those things, and this economic model that has been placed, it's not just in social work, it's in every facet of our, of our world, is we can see it all the way through all the levels of our government. We can see that we are now in a place where we have incentive sort of oriented performance measures, outcome measures, and that uh, this is now driving the train, so to speak. However, we still do have discretion, and we have a code of ethics that we're supposed to be following at the same time. So this is a, a difficult, it's a difficult path for us to follow. Let's go to the next slide. Did you go to the next slide? Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so this is, uh, does this say street level bureaucracy? All right, this is gonna be interesting. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna ask you something. You're gonna, gonna nod your head, I like that. Um, so, how many of you have ever read Street Level Bureaucracy before? This was a classic text that came out in 1980 by Michael Lipsky, who said, even though we think that maybe policy, st the policy starts at the front and then policy's delivered right by the social worker, there's not a single change along the way. Actually, he found, in, in actually at the street level, there's a ton of discretion, and that policy is happening on every chain, every link of that chain. And so that when it comes down to social workers, we are actually implementing, poli we are policy makers as social workers, right? We have discretion all along the way. It might not feel like it sometimes. Um, and in fact, I would like to um, talk about some of the tensions that we experience. Um, first of all, we've got rules that have to be followed, but there's also judgment that we wield. There's a tension there. Um, and we also know that we, we, even though we maybe would like to have more tension than we, than we possibly have right now, that sometimes we make up ways of doing things so we can do the job we know we need to do. And I'm not gonna say more than that, but you know what I'm inferring. Um, so I would like to say um, one thing to think about is that discretion of social workers is a political act, right? It symbolizes the government capacity as a vehicle for advancing social welfare, equity, and justice. Every time we interact with a client or a service user, we are demonstrating the possibilities of democracy. We are saying, you voted in, elected officials, decision, you know, a, a, a who, are, who listen to us and we advocate for them, and these are the policies that we as the people who have installed other folks in office and have supported them and, and talked with them that we would like to see. And I ask you, is this the way we really feel today? Is this how we feel about our services sometimes? So um, uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm probably running out of time. Um, so pr professional status. We have a state authority that, that we often have to follow, but you know there's another authority that we follow, and that is our professional status. So we have a code of ethics. We go to accredited schools. We pay a lot of money for graduate uh, degrees a lot of some, of some of the time, often most of the time. Um, and Evan says that professional status is important because it entails commitment to values that focus on service user well-being. Our primary goal when we go into this profession is to help people. That's why we've gone into this. Um, and it brings a greater degree of decision-making autonomy because of our motivations, partly. Um, also, let's see if I can see here. Yep, we're licensed. And we have a board of social work, obviously, that we know uh, uh, follows, follows us. We've got trust. We have trust from the community. 
and we have value. Oh, I've got a minute left. So this is what strong uh, discretion looks like. However, you can turn to the next slide. You'll notice my paper doc cutouts. See, less discretion is how what we're experiencing, as though we don't have the, um, the autonomy, the knowledge base, the ability to make decisions, that we have to be told how we're supposed to, be, how we're supposed to practice. And we feel this based on the kinds of performance measures that we often, uh, that we experience. Mimi Abramovitz and Jen Zelnick in New York surveyed 3,000 serv social service users, and they found that 90% of them believed they had too much work to do, and they had to do the same amount of work that they did before. 83% believed the amount of paperwork they had to do was problematic. 68% thought they didn't have enough time to see the people they served, and more than 50% believed that clients had too many requirements and that there was not enough time to build trust with clients. With clients. 68% felt that work was too standardized and routinized, and on, on and on. So this is not just in Minnesota. This is felt in New York City, and I am very, uh, I suspect, around the country. Let's go to the next slide, please. So you can read this story to yourself here, but maybe I will because I know of our online folks. I think I actually have it, but I'm gonna read also. Oh, Rachel, this is a composite of what I've heard from people over time. Uh, Rachel is employed at a nonprofit that serves families and children and Rachel works in the, uh, oh my gosh, mental health clinic. She was hired four months ago and she uh, thought she was, I feel as though she was excited. Can I pull this out? I have a PhD. All right, um, and, and though she was excited, uh, uh, she was excited, it's hard for me to, excited about the practice supervision promise, she had very little face-to-face -face time with her supervisor. She has an extensive caseload of clients who come to her office roughly once per week their problems cover a wide spectrum of issues. However, Rachel has been directed to diagnose them in a particular way, work with them in a particular way, and bill them in a particular way. She sees seven families a day with 10 minutes to record information from the session. She has a half hour to eat lunch. Every day she sees an extra family, she earns credit toward merit pay. Pay is reduced if she does not meet her productivity goals. Certain clients she can only see six, see six to 10 times with a bonus to cl close cases quickly. When a client misses a session, they are charged a fee if they do not cancel 24 hours ahead of time. Every time a family goes over their time due to crisis situation, she loses credit toward merit pay. Her supervision meetings have been mostly about her recording method and billing notes. If this sounds familiar to you in any way, would you raise your hand? Okay, so there we have an issue in our profession and we have issue in it with our caseload. Um, I know over time, I, I've probably gone over time, sorry about that, Cassie, but I would like to now turn it over to our story time. This is the most important part because these sorts of things can fester when we don't talk about it and we don't hear about it and that of often happens um, in social work. So let's have, I've got two different lovely people on either side. I've got a, a Jessica over here and a Jeff over there. And um, what we'd like for you to do, you can change the next slide, is Tell, have, have a story ready, think about a story. And I mean it, I'm looking at you, I see a lot of ex-students and faculty members and people I know, we want to hear from you, this is really important. And if you have a story that you've maybe sent in, and we, and we short of stories, we'll, we'll try to say that too. We're gonna have a minute to two minutes per story. You need to tell us, one, about the workload issue you're having, and then two, how you think it's impact affecting your clients. Um, and you can just line up on either side. And we've got, I know we've got a story ready to go. Uh, Josh is gonna start us off. And we do want to go ahead and invite our legislators and policymakers oh, to come on up to the table here. So if you guys wanna come on up here. So you have front row billing to see our social workers telling their stories. And I wanna just take a moment with our online audience and just let you know we are, we are I'm told I'm not supposed to apologize, but I'm going to apologize. You can't see the slides and the presenter at the same time. It's a camera sort of issue. Someday, the chapter, when you all, 15,000 social workers in Minnesota, join NASW, I will afford to buy the coolest camera ever, and you'll be able to, to do both of those things. So we're aware of that. We're re we apologize that that wasn't possible. We are going to post the slides for this evening on the discussion chat for the, the YouTube live stream, and we'll also have them available online um, on our website. Last note is for people on the live stream, I'm sure you're concerned and if you missed the slides at the beginning, you, you missed the note on this, but there are one and a half CEUs available for the evening 
And those at the end of the night, you'll get a link to the survey to complete for the evening. And in there, you can give us your email and we'll send you your CEU. So no worries about the CEUs. We are also collecting your stories. So if you're in our online audience and you have a story you'd like to tell and you did not send it in ahead of time, um, we are still collecting those and we'll be using those in lots of our work going forward. So there's a place in that evaluation for you to share those as well. Take it away. Hi, I'm Josh Klapperick, and I'm an adult rehabilitative mental health services practitioner in the Twin Cities. In this role, I provide in-home mental health services for people with serious and persistent mental illness. For the past three years, I have been the most senior practitioner on my team. Due to the immense amount of turnover that my team has experienced, I have watched practitioners leave for other positions, often within a year of hire, and many with a need to work more than one job. Uh, this impacts our clients because high practitioner turnover leads to limited meaningful time with clients, frequent transfers, and low service capacity, including requiring people to wait for services. The people we serve are hesitant to build another relationship, including establishing trust because they are often not receiving necessary mental health care in their homes, which frequently leads to costly crisis and hospitalizations and emergency room visits. Thank you for the example of workload and uh, turnover issues. Can you stay over on this side for our prayer? Hi, my name is Tammy Kincaid, and I am actually a faculty member as well as a practitioner in child welfare for over 30 years at all levels as a worker, as a supervisor, and as a county human services director in both uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So have been, child welfare has really kind of been my life. And one of the things I've seen over the course of my career is I think in our, our attempt, kind of exactly what Dr. Toft was talking about, in our attempt to so-called improve practice and uh, improve outcomes, that the legal system and all of the other parties that are involved with child welfare are telling the child welfare social workers what to do to the point where the workers I literally sometimes had to tell workers to say to the attorney, I'll do social work, you do law, because everyone is telling the social workers what to do, and the, the downside of that is when social workers really are the ones in the home, they don't trust their own judgment because everybody else in the system tells them you're not a professional, you're not the one with the professional judgment, and then families are, are obviously harmed in that process. And so I, it really kind of goes to exactly what Dr. Toft was saying, and I have seen this over, it's got getting progressively worse, actually, in an attempt to make the system better. And so please let social workers be social workers. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Ms. Kincaid. And um, we can have our next, we're gonna stay over here just so that, that we don't go back and forth and make our uh, online folks dizzy. And then we'll come over to this side uh, next. Hi, I'm Nancy Rodenberg. I'm a faculty member. Is that too loud? No. Oh, I heard. <laughs> okay, so I'm a social worker first and a faculty member second, the social work faculty member. And my uh, personal life, since this is systemic, uh, relates to higher education for social work and other things. So higher education, at least in my capacity, uh, we've uh, reduced our faculty tenure track by one third and increased our student enrollment by one third. Mm -hmm. So the difference, two thirds. That's a problem for me and our faculty in terms of holistic wraparound discretionary services to our students. Secondly, I'm the field coordinator where I'm uh, employed and it's increasingly difficult to find uh, good placements for students. There's many, many of the good placements. However, the, fact the social workers are stressed with their own workload. So it's difficult for the social work supervisors to find the time to holistically wrap their arms around our students and give them the modeling, the support, and the supervision that they need. So we have stress from both the educational, higher educational, and the uh, internship mentoring capacity. Thank you very much, Nancy. That's a great example of systemic issues. And super, just a note, there's very little research on the role that supervisors play in the sort of privatized, um, managerial sort of uh, practice. So this will be an interesting thing also to study. Let's go over to this side now. Thank you. Hi. My name is Stephanie Combe. I'm the Senior Director of Children's Mental Health Services at St. David's Center, which I, I can say that tonight because I'm, I'm here partly on behalf of that. Um, I've been pretty active in the last several years with um, an advocacy group called Aspire Minnesota as well. 
and we have been working very hard around trying to create children's mental health services that are um, able to continue into the future. And the reason why I say that is because several years ago, the legislature mandated a mental health rate study um, in which we um, didn't have as much of a turnout as we wanted because most agencies don't have resources to spend the amount of time that was required to complete the Mercer study. Um, but those of us that did, did our best. And what the finding was is that currently mental health rates are at least 25% under what they need to be to, to break even. And I have been in front of legislators on several committees asking for a consideration of rate increases because the reality is as much as I wanna be the social worker who works with our most at risk population, I don't know how to keep employing wonderful people like we have in this room who come out of grad school with fifty and $60,000 student loans and can't afford to work where we work, not because I don't wanna pay them, but because the reimbursement rate that we get through medical assistance is so poor that I can't turn around and, and pay them enough to, to make their jobs um, sufficient. And if I still have a little bit more time, the other thing I'm gonna say is um, I've also been advocating for more streamlining of um, requirements so that we are not chasing, you know, the, the joke that I make at work is that we are answering to multiple gods on any given progress note. And that is just not impossible to retain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well said. Dr. Kiesel. Hello, I'm Lisa Kiesel. I'm faculty at St. Catherine University Master of Social Work program. Um, the, uh, earlier this season, I, well, last season, I was riding the bus downtown, ran into my neighbor, and was happily telling him how I was headed downtown to volunteer. And he's like, wow, that's cool. What are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm volunteering to supervise children for child protection. And I'm thinking he's going to just smile and be so happy for me. And he looked at me like, what do you mean? The county uses volunteers to do that? So I was thrilled to be doing it, but I also see there's a huge problem when there's not adequate staffing to provide supervision for kids who's, whose parents have a right to see them. Seeing kids who have been removed and placed in foster care and whose parents are not able to live out their rights for contact with their children. We know that that contact at the, in the beginning of placement is so incredibly important. That is parenting time. That is not visitation. Mm -hmm. And my experience in the county is that there's lots of very concerned people, but there are not enough of them. And my next point may seem like a contradiction to that, <laughs> but my next point is I do believe that our child welfare workers need to be social workers. It is a setup for anyone. <laughs> it is a setup for anyone to come in this incredibly difficult and painstaking work to deal with what my colleague Tamara Kincaid said about having to answer to so many other authorities. It's hard to have a good critical thinking, ecological systems perspective to know what is the right voice to listen to and the right agenda to follow. Our kids deserve it, our families deserve it, we need to fund it, and we need to make it professional. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiesel. Wonderful point, I see we have another person here to speak with us. Hi, um, I'm Katie Weber. I am currently getting my MSW, um, and I just wanted to offer an intern perspective of all of this. Um, so currently I am an individual therapist in a school-based clinic in Minneapolis. Um, I've been there for a month and a half and I have seven clients that I meet with in a week and I'm still learning. My supervisor has 15. We don't have adequate staffing to provide services to the amount of kids that need it. We're in a school with a thousand children, a thousand teenagers, many of whom need mental health services who, oh, okay, I thought it ended, <laughs> who are actively suicidal, who don't have access, and we are their access, and we don't have the time. I can't meet with more than 10 clients in the school year. That will be my caseload is 10. My supervisors will be 18. That's, what, 38 kids? Out of a thousand that we can have an impact on, that's not enough. 
we need to be providing mental health to teenagers, to kids, whether it be in school, in outpatient mental health therapy, wherever it comes from, we need to be providing it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I, I want to just uh, remind people that they can continue to come down the sides. Please, we'd love to have you hear your voice. I also just want to make a comment about a couple of things that I've heard tonight. Um, first of all, I hear you calling out your professional authority. Let social workers be social workers. And um, let's have mental child welfare workers be licensed social workers or another. And I know there's, there's a lot to unpack there. But the idea that social workers, 125-year-old profession, we have graduate programs, we've got PhDs around this uh, particular room, because we have a body of knowledge and an expertise that we spend many years attaining to do the best quality work we can possibly do. I would also say, too, about the last piece, you hear the push here to get to do as much as you can with as little as possible. This is a theme on every particular level, be it education, be it direct line work, uh, be it the contracts that are set up with agencies uh, um, in order to work with uh, people. So this is something else for I would like for us to keep in mind. Um, I think we do have at least some online. I would love to hear some of those. How about let's go over to this side. Hi, so this is an email that we got from Ania Berg. Um, she was not able to attend tonight, so I'm just gonna read this email. She says, I am unable to be at under pressure in person, but wanted to share my experiences as a nursing home social worker. I have, been a so I have been a nursing home social worker for 33 years, and in that time I have seen the number of social workers in nursing homes decrease. The state of Minnesota goes by the federal regulation, which is one full-time licensed social worker for 125 beds. Any facility under 125 beds doesn't have to employ a full-time social worker. Instead, they employ an activity director in a dual role as a social services director. In my current position, there were three social workers to divide 170 clients. The corporation has decreased to two social workers, one for rehab and one for long-term care. We struggle to see our clients regularly, and some clients we may only see quarterly. The demand for our expertise has increased with the amount of paperwork, discharge planning, MA applications, behaviors, types of insurance, number of different case managers, and increased comorbidities. While nurses are making between $30 and to $50 per hour, plus overtime benefits, the social workers are making between $20 and $30 an hour. The average social worker in northern Minnesota uh, is paid $40,000 per year. And we just ran out of money for the lights. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, I can read like I wonder this. if we could have Should just I a little bit going? more light. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, okay. I can, I can see it. The state of Minnesota does not value the co contributions of social workers as their reimbursement is cents on the dollar. The state wants person-centered care, which is what social workers provide, but the state continues to invest in the medical personnel versus the person. The clients of nursing homes would be better served by full-time licensed social, social workers with no more than a caseload of 50 to 60 clients per social worker. The facilities with less than 50 to 60 clients should be required to have a full-time consulting licensed social worker. Our elderly population and our medically challenged younger persons deserve to have an advocate who has the time and the talent to help them navigate this industry, which is a social worker. Thank you for giving voice to our concerns, Ania. <laughs> Wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and sending that to us. Uh, the ideas about paperwork, how, but, but I'm sorry about for all this, this your percussion you hear on the mic. Um, uh, but the idea is paperwork taking up so much time of our time that we, who, to whose benefit does that serve? All this paperwork is, is, is sort of a system requirement that is time taken away from our clients. Now there are definitely 
places and times for paperwork, but the amount that is done and how much time it takes seems to be um, over the top and, and oppressive. Uh, is there, do we have another story? All right, anybody else? I want, I'm, I'm looking at you all out here, see my eyes? I, I would like to hear your stories about workload and about how you think it's impacting your clients. It would be great to hear from you. How about Sarah, do you have something from a, an online person? <clears throat> a social worker named Nicole Anderson shared this story with us. She has a similar story as to the one that was just shared with you all, um, that she is a social worker working in a skilled nursing facility, a long-term care facility, and she is seeing the same thing, that residents are not getting adequate care because of this federal rule that Minnesota um, uh, follows. They're not having their whole psychosocial well-being tended to, um, they're not having their needs identified, and they're not having those needs um, addressed. It's hard to find social workers for long-term care as the pay does not compensate for the stress. So thank you. Yeah. Yep, excellent. Sounds a lot similar to our last, the last point. Um, I think I see another couple social workers over here. I'd love to hear from you both, but one at a time. Hi guys, my name's Katie. Um, I am currently a mental health case manager um, and I'm also a recent graduate of the St. Kate's, St. Thomas uh, Masters in social work programs. So I'm kind of a newer social worker. One of the things that I've noticed in my work is there's a major shortage of crisis providers. So I do community mental health services. I'm not a crisis provider and a lot of my job is focused on crisis. So I work with a caseload of about 30 to 35 clients. I'm required by the county to see each one of them one time a month. Several of them require more than once a month visits. I'm not able to provide the same service to each person on my caseload because of those requirements. Somebody might be in crisis and because there isn't a crisis practitioner readily available to help that person, I'm the one who has to be there and who gets to go and help that person through their crisis. It's a part of my job. It shouldn't be. We need more crisis practitioners and more funding available for county crisis programs so that those individuals can be out there helping the people in the moment when they need it and not once a month like I am paid to do. That's all. Thank you very much, Katie. Yeah. Yeah, I like the claps. That's a nice show of support from each other. Yes, we've got an another one. Here. Christy, hi. So um, my name is Christy McCoy, and I am the legislative chair for the Minnesota School Social Workers Association, but I've also been a school social worker for the last 16 years. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I heard um, one of the colleagues earlier talk about the crisis when it comes to mental health and our students in our schools. And I know, um, sadly, because of the tragedies with the mass school shootings, that school safety has been on the forefront of all of our minds. I think it's really important that we recognize that there's a continuum of mental health care in our schools. That includes school-employed mental health staff, like clinical social workers, like myself, school-based clinics. So there's been a lot of money that's been going into these school-linked mental health clinics that provide a valuable service and also really partnering with community mental health um, programs that are culturally responsive. One of the things that I just wanna share with all of you, there are avenues where we know, number one, special ed is not fully funded, so we're not getting reimbursement for that. In addition to that, our greater Minnesota and rural Minnesota, we are seeing such a shortage in school-employed um, mental health providers that you might have a school social worker that is in charge of six schools. So how are they actually able to give the service to the students when all they're doing is kind of putting out fires? So we have to find a way to fully fund our school-employed mental health providers and to find a way either through the general fund to do that to really support the needs of our students. So it's really um, valuable that we look at that continuum and really support that continuum of mental health services. So thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Do we have one more? All right, look at that, yes. Courageous social worker. Hi, I'm Jenny. Um, I work at a nonprofit, I've been there for 10 years, I have my master's degree, but I'm not a social worker. Uh, the people that I work with are case managers, nurses, um, licensed psychologists, 
And I do housing for people who are homeless on the streets for a year or more, chemically dependent, and have STMIs. And one thing I've noticed about my coworkers who are all highly educated, like everybody in this room, is they have two jobs because their one job does not make ends meet. Most people have something else that they do to moonlight, whether it's at another mental health facility or something else. Um, and then I was asked from somebody I work with to mention something. that generally we're having a hard time recruiting due to the lack of workforce, low unemployment, and nonprofit wages. Um, that's one person's opinion. And the other person said, if they want to know the daily realities, there's a fine line between the people we serve and us workers being in their shoes tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that. Um, so you've raised, uh, 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 is, is it time, okay, so you raised some really important issues tonight. I wanna just mention one other piece about the social justice um, idea, and that in our education and in our license and in our code of ethics, we are supposed to also be engaged in the macro level. So that means in addition to our individual everyday work, we're supposed to have the time, the ability to do work that helps establish social justice. How many of you feel like you have that time built into your workplace? Let the, let the record show absolutely nobody raised their hand. Um, so this is an issue for social workers because we are supposed to be working for social justice and if all we can do is work when we're in a crisis, it's very difficult for us to work upstream. So we need to think of a way that we can do both of these things in order to actually fulfill our professional promise. All right, so now I would like to um, uh, have our uh, um, panel here respond to what what you've said today. I'm hoping that panelists that you can maybe reflect on some uh, some of the things that we heard. Um, we're interested in too if there's a way in which you'd like to engage us further from here. If you have some ideas about how you would like to stay in conversation about this issue and how we can um, move move along together, we would love to hear those also. Um, and I think that you have up to five minutes. I hate to be, but I'm, I'm going to be your referee, so be, I don't want to, you know. Anyway, so five minutes, um, and um, let's start here. We have uh, Jamie Sorensen um, from uh, DHS, who is in the um, coordinator of child, you have to tell me. Sorry, my notes are, I need my glasses. And <laughs> Jamie Sorensen with Minnesota um, DHS. I'm the director for child safety and permanency at the department, which is the child protection, foster care, and adoption systems here in Minnesota. And um, I originate from Wisconsin, have been certified as a social worker in Wisconsin since 1991, and I maintain that certification because someday maybe I'll go back there and do some case practice again. Um, thanks for um, sharing your comments. Um, thanks for your work with adults, children, families in the state of Minnesota, um, your contribution to um, some of the most vulnerable people in our state is commendable and so appreciated. You're not only helping the people that sit before us today, but the social return on investment and the generation to come and the generation after that. Um, it means a great deal and thank you for your, your commitment. In the comments that I heard, you know, a real common thread is your concern for the impact that these variables have on the outcomes of the people that you're trying to serve. And that some of those outcomes range from people and communities like schools actually having serious safety issues, um, but also not being able to sufficiently attend to um, behavioral outcomes, access to insurance, access to other resources. The time to do case plans, the time to engage in therapy, um, the time to engage in those kinds of activities that we know begin to help people in their change process. The inability to do advocacy, the inability to um, do sufficient needs assessments and then align those with services that will begin to have an impact. All of those things have a real clear impact on how well kids and families and adults do based on our work with them. When something happens and something goes terribly wrong, the first person that gets blamed is you. 
and the um, accountability goes to you. And I think these stories make really clear to us that we have to pay attention to the context within which each of us are trying to do our work. And um, I think the stories around um, workforce stability and recruitment and um, the disruption that those changes in staffing create for people are remarkable and the additional duress it puts on the people who stay and remain to pick up the pieces and cover the cases that need attention. Um, there was um, a survey done of the child welfare workforce in 2016 and I was struck by one of the responses because it talked about like, are you generally satisfied with your work? And 67% of the respondents said yes, they were, but 68% of the respondents also reported that they're extremely stressed. <laughs> so, you know, that's a little bit of irony, but I think that's the story of social workers in many regards, um, that people are really called to this work and it's something bigger than um, a paycheck and bigger than just a vocation, it is really contributing to the, the greater good. Um, these are stories and scenarios that um, are familiar to me. I work primarily in the area of child welfare. Um, they, in, they inform um, my work as I move forward and things that I will be um, remembering and considering as we continue to do our work to further develop Minnesota's child welfare workforce, to develop the Minnesota Child Welfare Training Academy, and to know that we need to focus more, we need to focus on more than just tr training, we need to focus on workforce stability, and we need to focus on workforce well-being. So thanks for your sharing your stories. All right. Well, um, uh, thank you uh, as well for um, this evening, uh, for um, honoring us by inviting us here and talking about the issues um, that are so important in, in your work and in your profession, um, but, but also thank you so much for the, the work that you do. Um, I meet every year with the, the social workers, and I get to say this every year, um, uh, to express my gratitude for um, the incredible role you've played in helping pass uh, important policies uh, that have been very, very important to me and to my legislative career, not the least of which, of course, is the anti-bullying bill, which uh, the social workers, when they jumped on board, really helped put us over the top, um, but also a number of others. So thank you very much uh, for, for your role. Um, as, as Karen said, oops, as Karen said at the outset, um, uh, it's absolutely true that when, when the social workers um, come to the legislature or hold forums or invite me to any sort of, of events, um, I hear about um, social justice and the big issues that affect our community and our shared experience of, of living in, in Minnesota. Um, social justice uh, initiatives are at the forefront of, of, of what um, you talk about and what's good for your clients. Um, but I'm really glad to be here tonight because I want to affirm what Jessica and Karen and all of you are talking about, make no apologies for standing up for your profession, for your professionalism, for your education, what you do and what you bring, and, and how you're paid and your, and your um, working conditions um, are a reflection of, a direct reflection of how much society, how much the state, how much the legislature values uh, what you do. And clearly that we're falling short. Um, and, and connecting that to outcomes, <coughs> connecting that to the effect of, which all of you did very beautifully in your stories, I appreciate very much. A few things that struck out, stuck at, uh, jumped out for me, um, the, you know, the very first uh, example um, that Jessica showed, um, the perverse incentives um, embedded in, in some of these merit pay initiatives, reminds me a lot of the conversations that we've had, um, you know, with, uh, with manage, the managed care system and the frustrations that people have in accessing just just you know, medical services. You know, doctors who are who are paid on uh, on productivity goals and et cetera. Very, very perverse incentives. Matter of fact, one of my best friends is a doc who ended up leaving his system because he found out that he was being reimbursed on the basis of how many people he processed through the clinic per day and how many tests he ordered. You know, just all kinds of things that drive up costs and drive down uh, better outcomes for people. So, so bringing that out, the the, the legislature, the policymakers, and the public will really be able to access and understand. Uh, those sorts of examples. 
Um, mental health reimbursement, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and the lack of availability of mental health services, where people need it. I always think, you know, gosh, you know, we wouldn't just like accept that um, there's no cancer, um, access to cancer docs in, you know, vast swaths of, of the state of Minnesota, the way we accept that there's simply no access to mental health supports and services. We just accept these huge gaps in what is an indistinguishable aspect of delivering uh, health services that people need everywhere in the state. We, we divide, artificially divide. Um, so and, and of course, the whole subject of MA reimbursement, big, big conversation, the pay differential, um, also a very stark uh, uh, way to, to really illustrate the, the challenge that you confront, the pay differential between, oh, do I, oh sorry, I'm trying not to like, tr I know, but I'm afraid of the feedback, so <laughs> I was trying to find the right balance here. Anyway, so just, you know, the, you know, the paperwork, um, you know, the, uh, the, the lack of, of uh, being able to exercise your professional discretion, uh, being overloaded in your cases, um, being, being, having dr being drawn into crises uh, uh, and away from, uh, from the crux of your work and the fact that crises occur because you're not doing the proper case planning and, and, uh, and the upstream work that you need to do. These are all about um, supporting the data with stories and anecdotes and, and touching the public and touching legislators um, uh, uh, where they, uh, with, their, with the values that they share um, and that's how you make change. Um, but I wanted to end with um, just really uh, making sure that, actually I have two, point, two final points to make. One is um, making sure that um, the public and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, and, the, and the array of stakeholders um, with, in, with whom you're going to work in coalition really understand what social workers do and the value that social workers bring. Because I do think among a number of my colleagues there is a fundamental lack of understanding um, and hence the devaluing. We think it's kind of a nice, uh, a nice thing kind of at the, at the margins of the crux of what we do in schools and long-term care settings and, and other sorts of, of, of settings. Um, the fact that th the work you do is absolutely fundamental. It's called out in statute. Um, what is the expression you use, Jessica? The delivering social, just, uh, social goods or social backbone of social, the provision of social, um, yeah, backbone of social provision. Um, yeah. Fundamentals, so, yeah, <laughs> so, so core. Um, so, so really make sure that legislators really understand what you do and the value you bring and how essential it is, um, is, is task number one and two. I mentioned coalition, working in coalition with lots of folks um, who know and understand and derive value and benefit from and can validate the stories that you bring is, is also gonna be very important. Um, and so I would like to continue in conversation. I, I, you know, I love learning about this, uh, these sets of challenges and love, love to help plan how to proceed successfully with really good policy and, uh, and resource allocation changes at the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, and um, I'm Melissa Wickland. I, I've been in the Senate now since 2013, and I've had um, the good fortune to be able to work on uh, a few items that relate to your um, legislative agendas over, over the years, and I really have appreciated working with you, and I um, appreciate being invited tonight to hear your daily experiences and um, the, the, the stresses you face in your, in your work. It does help us do our jobs better um, as legislators to, to know um, what you're facing um, in terms of not only the, the stress on your individual job, but what you're facing in terms of turnover um, and retention and, um, and then on the other hand, that uh, not being paid really what, um, what you're worth. Um, it's really uh, challenging we do here in the legislature about a lot of key issues relating to mental health and um, the lack of uh, the system in Minnesota um, to provide good mental health care to um, everyone who needs it. Um, in our educational system, we know that um, our students are not um, feeling supported and connected um, to the, the types of resources they need in their schools. Um, and so hearing your stories tonight about um, your, your situations is certainly um, powerful to me and I appreciate that. Um, also appreciate hearing about the profession in terms of your, your, the concept of social justice being integral to your profession. Um, it's certainly something that I 
try to keep in forefront of my mind as I work on policy that uh, we all need to be working hard to make bigger change in our world because um, so many of the issues that we see people facing are because our, our the structure of our society um, it needs to be changed. Our priorities um, need to change. So um, that is helpful to know about your your um, code of ethics. Um, I was thinking about what to say in terms of how to work, how to be working on um, issues with the legislature. Um, I think there's a couple or three different uh, types of points I guess I would make. Um, in terms of policy changes, I heard that you know, you have some, some policy change that really could help not only you do your jobs better, but could have a great, you know, a positive impact on families and um, what they are dealing with in our, our school systems and in other, other systems. Um, I, I am happy to work um, together with your, however you want to bring forward specific policy bills like that. I think there are other legislators who are interested in that as well. Um, and so that kind of work, um, as we get closer to the session, we'll, you know, it's, it's a matter of connecting with legislators, um, helping them understand what a specific proposal uh, is that you'd like to see move forward and, and educating them and then working with the committees that, that they would be, um, need to influence for that particular bill. Um, I, I think we need to look at things that are conditions today that are our, our issue areas, uh, certainly reimbursement rates. Um, I felt hopeful a couple years ago when I heard that we were gonna do a mental health rate study and that that would be a way to lead to some changes. Um, and now, we, now that we've gotten that, <laughs> we need to actually work on how do we move those changes forward because we can see that we have um, seriously the the rates are not where they need to be. So that's certainly something that um, now that we have a rate study, we need to actually make use of the, the data that we have. Um, and uh, in the K-12 system, educational system, um, I've struggled with how do we, uh, how do we encourage our um, school systems to hire more social workers when we don't have um, well, if we have guidelines, they're, they're not, you know, they're enforced, <laughs> basically. I mean, we, we have guidelines on numbers of counselors, but those aren't enforced. And as you are relaying stories of, of situations where people have to cover many schools and can't do that um, reasonably, things like that. Um, and I don't know, we, you know, we just need to have more conversations about what, um, what are ways we can place uh, more policy pressure on school districts to encourage them to, to hire the right number of people. And obviously it's funding, um, you know, they need more funding, but also we need to find ways to, to get them to balance um, the choices they make, you know, in terms of where that funding goes. So um, there's work to be done there and I'm um, out of time, but um, just wanted to mention that we also need to look at upstream um, and figure out ways that we can be helping people um, before they get to, to a point of need. Um, how do we look at the social determinants of health and, and look at housing, look at um, issues with transportation, food insecurity, how we can get uh, people paid more what they're worth so that they have access to the things they need without um, getting to the point of uh, you know, being in a, a, a bad situation. So. I think there's always, there's a lot of work to be done there as well. So look forward to working with you more during session. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and I'll try not to breathe on it directly so it doesn't feedback so much. <laughs> Thank you for your work and, and that's why. Thank you for your work and for what you do. And I want to say the thing I like, the thing social workers have done very well in recent years, Social Work Day at the Capitol. I think it's the biggest day at the Capitol, largely because almost every student social worker shows up. And when, when you want to make a difference, showing up does make a difference. And I think the reason social work 
as this profession has recognized to do that is because you advocate, your job is to advocate for your clients one-on-one, -on -one, the time you spend with them. Your job is to advocate for them everywhere. And that means changing policies that will make their lives better, make your work more successful. And that's why it's so important to come to the Capitol and like Senator Wicklund just said, I mean, there are some of the changes when you were talking earlier about how clinical social worker diagnosing ADHD is not enough to get them the services at the school. That's not a hard thing to change. Some may argue, oh, this is going to cost more. You try the same thing for PTSD, you said, for workers' comp. I know there's going to be some pushback against it. But those are things that could be changed, and they're not hard to change. And working with, I think, anybody up here is happy to work with you on them. So keep up, keep coming to the Capitol, keep fighting for those changes. I wanted to mention two other things that we've heard a lot of today. Um, this first one, don't feel like you're the only ones who are stuck with this, but the paperwork. Uh, I was just at a school town meeting in St. Paul or before this, and the same thing came up there, and it especially the social worker from the school who was speaking, talking how few kids she could see because of the paperwork. And that paperwork, why do we require it? Oh, it's accountability. We're going to make sure everybody's doing it just right. One of your presentations a little while ago talked about how we're being told over and again by supervisors, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. And then when you go to work, you're working with patients where you don't, clients you don't see. I'm not worth anything because everybody's telling me how to do my job. And the point we have to recognize is there's been a huge overkill, not just in social work, not just in special education, but the entire medical field will tell you the same thing. Burnout from professions, people who are doing it because somehow we're going to squeeze every penny we can out of them, make sure they're doing it exactly right. If that means the doctor's got 40 years of a career, for 40 years, every time they do some procedure, they got a mark down, they did these six steps. That doesn't make any sense, but we somehow think we're going to be more accountable that way. And so don't feel you're the only ones being picked on. But we have to, as a society, decide, why don't we have people spend the work time doing the work they're trained to do? Have you do the work. Use your professional judgment. <laughs> the same thing holds for doctors and nurses and others who are trained to do work. Have them do the work without somebody looking over their shoulder, not really looking over their shoulder, but making you write it all down and check the boxes and do this for reimbursement or for some quality control measure. There are plenty of ways to address quality, and the best one is not to have people record over and over again every little trivial thing they've had to do. The other one, <laughs> the other one that relates to that is the funding one. Uh, the same thing we heard from the St. Paul schools, the same thing, lack of funding. They were talking, you know, we could fund our schools adequately, $4.3 billion a year. Well, that's a lot of money. But, you know, as the old bumper sticker used to say, if you think education's expensive, try ignorance. Well, the same thing in social work, the same thing in a lot of areas of society. If we invest upfront, upstream, if we do things upfront, we can prevent problems from getting worse. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and there's a lot of wisdom to that. But we don't have time. You're talking about, yeah, the social workers in the school, one social worker for six schools? I mean, how are they going to have time to do that? If they deal with a crisis situation, they're going to do nothing to prevent kids who are on the edge of crisis because they're home, they were, became homeless that week or because their parents lost a job or their parents left them or chemical dependency problems or anything else. You don't have time to even see these kids. And how do we expect them to learn? How do we expect them not to have more serious problems? And I'd say we have to recognize that taking care of each other costs money. I would argue it's cheaper in the long run to take care of each other than to ignore it, which is what we're living with now. We have much higher problems with that. And one of the things we have, you will hear a lot of people say, everything government does, they're not, they gotta be more efficient. Child care, social work, things like that. Education, they're not getting more efficient. Why, look, farmer 100 years ago could feed 15 people. Now a farmer can feed 100 times that many or 1,000 times that many. Look at manufacturing. You could make a widget for this much one time. Now you can make them for one-tenth the cost or one-hundredth the cost. Look at technology. Computer data management has cost one billionth as much as it did 20 years ago. And look at social workers. Social worker spends a half hour with a client. 
Well, they spent a half hour 30 years ago with a client. Why can't they do it in 10 seconds? And you see why that doesn't work. I mean, that's the same thing. Why not a string quartet? You could make it more efficient. Take away one of their members. Well, it's not the same thing. It doesn't work that way. But people have a fundamental misunderstanding of, of economics when they say government's got to be as efficient as a business. Yes, it should be efficient in everything management-wise, but you've got to recognize a social worker working with a client has got to take time, and it's time that we should be paying for, time with your expertise, not how many people you can rush in and out the door because you know it's not serving people well, and that means adequate reimbursement rates and everything else, but that also means we have to start changing the dialogue so people recognize we've got to invest in society, we've got to invest in each other, and that's why I appreciate social workers so much because that's what your job is, that's what your calling is, that's what your vision is for the future, and I think we all want to work with you on that. Thank you. So uh, State Representative Dave Pinto, I hopefully, hopefully this microphone will work and all, and I think you have my bio up there, um, perhaps, and uh, so I, um, I'm the chair of the Early Childhood Committee in the House, and so a lot of what Senator Marty's talking about, about um, making a difference uh, going upstream and how if we can be working with um, people, we can make such a big difference. And I feel like that goes even more, of course, at the very beginnings, uh, beginnings of life. Um, I'm so grateful to be here, and thank you for sharing uh, the powerful stories that you have. I have some familiarity with uh, the profession representing St. Kate's, um, so those out there, woo, I'm happy to have you there, yes. And part of St. Thomas, um, I should note uh, that uh, we have a colleague in the room who's not up here, which is Representative Kali Her represents the other part of St. Thomas. There she is. Um, and a champion on so many of the issues um, that you all um, are working on uh, as well. Um, I, uh, I was listening to the presentation uh, and, and looking at the, um, uh, you know, from policy all the way down and that, that slide, and I was thinking about how um, you are so much on uh, social workers on the front lines of democracy, and you're feeling stressed, and we heard so much about that in your powerful um, testimonials. Um, but if you've noticed, our democracy is feeling pretty stressed. Um, and so I guess what I'd say is, uh, is I want to make sure that we know that there is a connection um, between uh, all of that. Um, we don't value human services. We don't value taking care of one another. We don't value caregivers in family settings, and we don't value those who are lifting up other people in their professional roles um, as you are. And I think we, we need to recognize that the stresses that you're describing really are connected with some big societal trends. Um, they're connected with uh, increased inequality in our society, in our country, and even in our world um, over the past number of decades. Real wages have been stagnant for most Americans, while there are a group that have become much wealthier. Um, we know that there has been much scarcity. We're in a period where at least that's been the rhetoric, and much more in all sorts of public services in all sorts of areas. Um, and I think we, we need to not underestimate the scale of the challenge before all of us. Um, policy change and doing this work is hard, and I hate to, I hate to burden you with, um, with additional responsibilities, um, though I will say that you, as the people who are on those front lines, have particular expertise that you can share with all the rest of us about how policy is actually working and how policy is not working and the need to to make a change and to probably put our society and our, our approach on a pretty different trajectory. So I agree, Social Work Day at the Capitol is phenomenal, and so keep that up. Bring along family and friends. Bring I mean, just like, just keep at it and recognize that our democracy really needs everybody, that those of us who are serving in elective office are playing a particular role, but I'll say it's become increasingly clear to me that our role inside the Capitol really is so dependent on the work and the connections and everything that's happening outside of the Capitol. And so again, I want to not burden you all with that additional role and responsibility. You don't have that professional time built into your day. Um, but to the extent that you can, as social workers, continue that, um, that involvement at that macro level, I don't know if it's like a double macro or what it is, like getting involved in terms of policy advocacy. This is not a partisan thing, but I will say campaigns and elections and the politics side of it, wherever you are at, but to get to recognize that, that the decisions that are made at ballot boxes and then all the way along the line, that's what ends up impacting 
the number of clients that you're seeing and whether we in fact are paying you as the professionals that you actually are and treating you as the professionals that you are. Because so much of what I heard was that lack of, of professionalism, which in a way it's maybe not surprising that we don't treat you as professionals in terms of the management side or that you're not being treated that way if you're not being compensated that way as, as well. And yet the work that you're doing could not be more critical. So I really want to encourage you, please um, stay involved as I know that you are. And um, and use your own uh, your own elected officials and us um, to uh, I mean basically keep pushing us and keep on doing that again and again and again and um, and uh, when you do that I know that we're going to get to some great places so thank you so much again for organizing this really appreciate it. I hope this there you go this is on thank you so much to our elected representatives and to our executive branch uh, uh, representative also. Um, I want to also thank you here and you who are watching tonight. You told stories that made a difference, um, and they heard. And this is the this is the part of the process we're going to have to stay engaged in. These are human-made problems that we are experiencing. This wasn't from nature. It wasn't just an invisible hand that flew out of the sky. These are human-made problems, and they can be actually addressed. My time's up. They can actually be addressed um, hu with human with human solutions. So let's keep that involved. And I also want to say social workers helped end child labor. We were the major architects of the Social Security Act. We, for women, we were the ones who um, addressed maximum hour laws and minimum wage laws. We were the main advisor on the war on poverty programs. We've been involved in workplace issues before, and I'd like to see us to continue that tradition. So thank you so much for your involvement tonight. Thank you, Jessica. And to all of you who shared your stories this evening, to our moderator, Dr. Jessica, Jessica Toft, and to our five policymakers at the table, as well as Representative Kerr, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Raphael Ortega staff folks, thanks so much for making it this evening. This is a really powerful night. And as I said earlier, this is really the start of something. I wanna make sure to just give a little shout out to Senator Wickland who helped us pass duty to warm protections for social work students and interns last year. Yeah. And she said she's liked working with us on things. That's what she was talking about last year. So we did some really important work last year and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, we can't keep working on this one policy to the next, however. This has to be a bigger conversation, folks. We need a new narrative. Several of our legislators talked about this, this need to tell the story in a way that talk, speaks to the bigger picture of what's happening in our democracy right now. So we need this new narrative for ourselves, for our communities, one that our communities can hear, that our employers can hear, that our policymakers can hear, and our, that our funders can hear as well. There are lots of conversations l yet to be had, but we appreciate those who've been here tonight so far. In terms of taking our next steps together, I urge you all to take these issues into your workplaces, into your communities, onto your social media, to claim your space as social workers. Don't shy away from it. Don't wait for those moments for someone else to bring it up. Bring it up yourselves. Carry around your NASW swag, right? <laughs> it says, proud to be a social worker. Wear it let people know that when they get you, when they get the services that they get from you at their so hospital or in their school or in that community-based setting or with the young people they're working with in child welfare, that they're getting a social worker, a trained social worker. And when people say to folks like, oh, I didn't know you were a social worker, that's why you think about this differently than we do. We have to claim that space, folks. I also hope that you will leave your stories with us tonight. I know many of you were taking notes. I know many of you in the audience had stories that were percolating inside you that you've been thinking about. And I know our online audience as well probably has all kinds of stories to tell. These stories, as our legislators um, talked about, are so powerful in our chapter being able to tell the big picture story of how these workforce issues are affecting our, our workforce and the clients that we're serving. So I hope that you'll leave those with us, that you'll continue to send them in, email them to us, and as I said, you can submit them through the evaluation for the event as well. I hope you'll also call or email the office if you have other ideas for tangible ways that we can help you affect change 
in your workplace, if you need a speaker to come out and help you tell the story of why social workers are different, give me a call. We need to be doing this work together. I also hope that you'll join our SPAN or our PACE committee. Our Social Policy Action Network is the group that puts on, uh, puts together our legislative agenda and works with our coalition partners and puts forward all kinds of different policy um, ideas and whatnot. We'll be talking with our legislators and s deciding which things we bring to the table this year. So that's our, our Social Policy Action Network. And our PACE committee is our Political Action for Candidate Election group, and that's the group that endorses candidates for office. And I hope that some of you in the, in the audience um, tonight will also think about running for office. These are real people. Did you notice that tonight? Like, they're just like us, and they get the issues, and some issues they get better than others, and I bet they go to events all the time where they have to do a little research before they even get to the event to think about the issues that they're going in to talk about. This isn't all you know, things you have to know everything about before you go into it. But we've been told that people in general have to be asked, how many times is it? I've heard three, but I've also heard like seven, eight times before they'll run for office. So I'm asking all of you, if you've never been asked before, this is your first time, please run for office, okay? And tonight, ask one another so we get those numbers up a couple times too. That'd be good. Um, so do that. And if you decide to run for office or you know someone fantastic who is going to run for office, let us know at the chapter because we want to endorse them. We want to talk to them first. And then we want to endorse them and support their campaign and then and make friends along the way here so that we can continue this important work. I also hope that you in the audience, if you're not yet members of NASW or you haven't renewed your membership in a while, it is a yearly membership. Um, but I hope that you will think about joining or renewing. It's really important that as an association that we are all joining in this work together. And the biggest way you can do that is ante in a little bit of your contribution. You get a ton back um, in terms of continuing education and this policy work and things that we are doing on your behalf. And we really need all of you at the table for that important work. So I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. If you're with us on the live stream, thank you for putting up with our technical difficulties as well. We will have a recording of the event available online. So if you had a quote along the way here that you were hoping to grab for your colleagues, you can grab that as well. And I hope you'll all go on and complete our evaluation and give us some feedback for the future. And most of all, I hope to see you at Social Work Day at the Capitol. It's not a student event. It is Social Work Day at the Capitol, OK? So as I talked about, I need to see you all there and along the way also. Have a great night.